Isidro Origins, Runaway Thief and Protégé of the Black Swordsman, Explored. If you'd have told someone who has been reading Berserk since 1989 that a stone-slinging kid would end up becoming the Black Swordsman's protégé one day, they'd have laughed you out of the room. And yet, that is exactly what happens when this stone-slinger enters Guts' life. Isidro, who has more nicknames than he has kills to his name, is a tiny kid with big dreams. His inspiration is the very man he travels with, though he is blissfully unaware of it and his comedic partnership with Puck is a much needed reprieve from the dark world of Berserk. But deep down, this sneaky little thief has one grand dream, and his story is about whether he possesses the guts to make good on it. Pun very much intended. Because, to become the greatest swordsman in the world, one has to be willing to take the lives of their opponents on occasion. And it is that conflict that has come to define his story. So without delaying things any further with a massive intro, let's take a look at how a runaway thief became the sole protege of the Black Swordsman. This is Isidro's Origins, Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. He might be young, but he knows his way around a war-torn and plague-ridden land. Isidro's Introduction to Berserk It's rare seeing a teenager not only keeping up with, but actively outsmarting adults in a seinen manga. But Isidro is like a shonen protagonist in a seinen story. He is introduced in chapter 133, and it is clear from the get-go that this kid is anything but what he makes himself out to be. As he was traveling through a village abandoned by its residents due to famine, plague, and a Kushan invasion, Isidro was set upon by a group of bandits. Seeing the kid carrying more loot than they could find in the whole village, the bandits demand that Isidro turn over his supplies to them, but the brat calls them worthless adults instead. He taunts them about the fact that they were resorting to stealing from a child because of their ineptitude, and claims they make him sick, when the largest bandit of the group steps forward to intimidate him. He calls Isidro a sneak thief, and threatens to end his life before he can become a sickening adult himself, and the kid surprisingly gives up pretty easily. He starts talking back, calling his intimidator a word that is socially unacceptable these days, but then decides better of it because he wants to know a woman in his life at least once before he dies. So, he gives up his satchel of food to the bandits, including some liquor that he had found in the stony huts of the village. The hungry thugs wolf down everything in sight, and Isidro chastises them for not savoring it, but the change in his tone is something none of the adults notice until it's too late, that is, because they're hit with a wave of nausea thanks to the poison that he spiked their food with. The hulking bandit that tried to intimidate Isidro earlier now threatens to crack the little punk's head open, but Isidro smacks him in the face with a string of sausages he had saved for himself inside his coat. He then cracks the brute right down the middle of his head and introduces him to the rest of his bandit party. They don't exactly get to witness his cool moment in the sun because they're down on the ground struggling to even breathe properly, but Isidro asks them not to sweat it. The poison was non-lethal, he thought, and besides, they were too crappy at their job to continue doing it anyways if they had to be lectured by a literal child. He bids them adios and starts to leave when the rest of the bandit party appears worrying after their fallen comrades. Isidro was in a severe pinch because he didn't expect there to be more of them, but his quick wit managed to save him from immediate death. He starts crying to draw the attention of the bandits to himself, and then blames their comrades' current state on the Kushan. The great emperor Ganishka's invasion of Midland had been a disaster for the defending side, as the Kushan steamrolled through the western forces capturing every city in sight. It was a smart play for an impromptu one, but because it was impromptu, it immediately started falling apart. As Isidro tried to sneak his way to safety, the bandits recovered from their initial shock and started asking him just where these Kushan were, and why he had been spared when their comrades hadn't. They knew the Kushan showed no mercy on the battlefield, even to children, so it was strange that they'd leave him behind. Isidro was panicking for his life on the inside, but he tried a final Hail Mary and pointed in a random direction, intending to make a break for it. To everyone's shock, the bandit he was directing received a Kushan projectile straight to the face, as the entire group was surrounded by Ganishka's Bakiraka scouts. They ambush the bandits and make short work of them, while Isidro watches everything cowering behind a wooden barrel. 
The kid who seemed fearless a moment ago was crying for his life, and rightfully so, because the bandits were not wrong about the Kushan not sparing children in their conquest. He's discovered by a Kushan scout, and is about to get murked when Guts steps into the village. The Black Swordsman was on his way to St. Albion, and stepped to the Kushan scouts with zero fear in his eyes, something Isidro thought was stupid at first. His concern quickly turned into an awestruck gape as he witnessed the power of Guts with the Dragon Slayer firsthand. The Black Swordsman mowed his path through the Kushan scouts without even knowing who they were, and all Isidro could do was marvel at his massive sword and his iron fist. This guy was a walking weapon, but Isidro wasn't, which is why he was asked to duck down behind his wooden barrel by the creature that would later become his constant companion. We're talking about Puck, of course. The elf tells the kid that he is going to take all his food and liquor as payment for saving his life, but Isidro couldn't care less in the moment. The food he had outsmarted half a dozen bandits for was worthless in front of the sight of his brand new idol. See, Isidro might have been a thief by nature, but he was a swordsman at heart. His great desire was to become a mercenary of great renown one day, and so, to him, witnessing Guts slaughter Kushan like training dummies was a sight close to being worshipful. He was so caught up in the awesomeness of the Black Swordsman's malevolent wrath that he didn't mind Puck taking all his food, and started following the pair instead. It took him an entire day and a half and a hitchhike with refugees to finally catch up to Guts, who outpaced him simply by running. Isidro had finally located the man he knew he wanted to hitch his own ride to for the foreseeable future, and he would soon learn that it wasn't going to be an easy thing for anyone involved. He learns about the dark truth of the world with Guts, Sneakadro's failure and redemption. When Isidro finds Guts, the Black Swordsman is sleeping, and his Dragon Slayer lies unprotected. So, naturally, the sneaky thief decides to give it a go himself. He starts lifting the sword by its hilt end, but starts hitting a wall pretty early on, which is when he receives instructions from his soon-to-be best friend. Maybe it was the adrenaline that normalized it for him, or maybe he just didn't notice him because of how focused he was on Guts, but Isidro starts getting advice from Puck on how to properly lift the Dragon Slayer. The elf tells the kid to put his back into it if he wanted to lift the Dark Blade of Obliteration, and gives him his own name first, before calling him rude for not revealing his own. Isidro's internal monologue goes from mild shock at seeing a fantasy creature to pure annoyance in the span of a few panels, and thus begins a relationship that is one of the highlights of Berserk to this day, but that's a personal opinion of ours. Many Berserk purists dislike Puck and Isidro's relationship and existence in the story as comic relief characters, yearning for the days when the former acted as the Black Swordsman's conscience in the early days of Berserk, but we'd argue that Isidro and Puck's innocent friendship gives much need lightheartedness to the story. Berserk is a dark tale, and it doesn't shy away from depicting many dark things in graphic fashion, but if Kentaro Miura didn't balance this out with a few lighthearted characters, then he'd just have a depressing story on his hands. The author of the manga made the conscious choice to depict Puck and Isidro's relationship more like a shonen artist would, in order to remind readers that though Berserk's world is disturbing, people can still smile and find happiness within it. This is definitely author bias creeping into our opinion of a character, but this is the only time we'll address the duel of Isidro and Puck in depth, so we might as well get it all out while we have you here. From day one, Puck starts teaching Isidro his elf dimension style, which is one of Berserk's funniest running gags, and we think that Isapuck is one of the most wholesome manga friendships of all time. Having said that, Puck also frames him for stealing in their first encounter, because when Dragon Slayer inevitably falls on top of the much lighter Isidro, it wakes up Guts, and Puck claims to have caught him a Sneakadro. Just chestnut Puck things, huh? The Black Swordsman asks Isidro why he has been shadowing him for a day and a half, making the young man realize he had always known what was going on. He denies Puck's theory that he wants to be Guts's apprentice though, saying he was never going to be under anyone in his life. This reminds Guts of himself and he understands the child's feelings instinctively when he sees his sword. He asks Isidro if he had ever cut down anyone with it, and the kid sheepishly states that he might have once or twice but Guts tells him it's best for his sake that he stay away altogether, and as if to back his point up, the souls of those killed by Father Mosgus with the breaking wheel arrive right on cue. Isidro can't believe what he's watching, dozens of wagon wheels moving by themselves with reanimated corpses attached to them. He pinches himself hard and is even hit on the head by Puck with a burdock to make him realize this was really happening, and at first, his reaction was that of a standard human being, fear. 
Isidro never recalled being cursed with chasing wagon wheels, and as he began running from these possessed ones, he vowed to never swipe from a carriage ever again. He'd have turned into roadkill had Guts not intervened at the last possible moment. The Black Swordsman explains to Isidro that them getting attacked didn't mean he was cursed, and begins cutting a path through the wheels to higher ground where they wouldn't catch up with him. Isidro follows Guts and nearly falls victim to the dead spirits, breaking his sword in the process. But once they reach the cliff, the Black Swordsman hurls him off of it. Despite bearing witness to a literal scene out of hell, Isidro remains undeterred in his goal to train under Guts, and so he follows him all the way to St. Albion, and manages to convince him to stay for this mission at the very least. Isidro's head becomes Puck's temporary residence, and he becomes Guts' apprentice and sidekick in all but name. His first act as the Black Swordsman's companion was to free Luca and her prostitutes from their fetters. Dropy had also developed a crush on Luca herself after witnessing her fiercely passionate speech to the Holy Iron Chain Knights. As he followed her to the tent where Casca was supposed to be, Puck asks Isidro why he's following Guts. The kid answers him after they split up to look for the branded girl because she wasn't where Luca left her. Isidro observed that the refugees gathered at St. Albion chose to flee their homes rather than stand and fight the Kushan, and it made him sick to his stomach. When Puck asks if he could have done what he was berating the refugees for, Isidro says of course he could, because all a real man needed was a sword to defend himself. Isidro wanted to become a well-known swordsman, and Puck figured that this was why he wanted to become Guts' apprentice, since the Black Swordsman was one of the best fighters of his generation. But the sneaky stone thief states that a real man doesn't serve under another, and that he would steal Guts' techniques if he had to do it to prove his ideology. His plan was to perform a huge favor for the swordsman, which would make him indebted to the young man. And if he couldn't do that, maybe he'd take this Casca girl hostage and see how things went. Puck remarks that Isidro really is a thief, and that him and Guts are two peas in a pod when both of them hear Nina's screams. Isidro and Puck spot the pagan cultist carrying Casca and Nina off to their lair in the mountains, and the former displays astonishingly quick thinking for someone his age. Isidro quickly realizes that his best course to make Guts indebted to himself was to track the cultists to their lair and inform the Black Swordsman afterwards. He was confident in his ability to shadow them without being detected, and so he began his quest to become the Black Swordsman's apprentice. Isidro managed to locate the heretic's hideout, but was heavily disturbed by what he saw there. The cultists were planning to use Nina as an offering to their supposed witch queen, Casca, in order to bring in a new world order of some kind. And to make things worse, they were going to do it all naked. Oh, and there was also the little caveat of the cult leader declaring he was going to marry Casca after Nina's sacrifice. Isidro and Puck freak out at the situation unfolding in front of their eyes, but the kid notices where they are standing and realizes the golden opportunity at his hands. He tells Puck he's going to buy him some time, time enough for the elf to bring Guts to the heretic's lair. The elf starts roasting Isidro for being competent for the first time since meeting him, but the kid is revved up by the thought of having the high ground. He picks up a stone and hurls it straight at the eye of the cultist trying to carve up Nina as a sacrifice. Isidro scores a direct hit that blinds the cultist and thoroughly impresses Puck. The aspiring swordsman claims he doesn't like resorting to such cheap tactics given his great ambition, but for now, there was no choice. This is when Puck puts two and two together and realizes that Isidro's name is actually a pun. In Japanese, Isidro's name is a combination of the words Ishi, which means stone, and Dorobu, which means thief. Thus, Isidro's name literally translated to stone thief, something the stone-slinging child was highly aware of. Isidro calls out the cultists for their heresies and claims he will rat them all out, and his distraction allows Puck to leave the cave at top speed. The stone thief manages to do pretty well against a swarm of naked cultists rushing at him for blood. He used their nakedness to his advantage and was holding them back pretty well when the Holy Iron Chain Knights showed up to clear out all the heretics. Isidro might have breathed a sigh of relief then, but it surely turned into a gasp of horror when the heretics became possessed by the spirits of the dead and turned into bloodthirsty monsters. As Isidro continued to stave off the possessed heretics, he finally located Casca and Nina and dived off his vantage point to save them from a creature threatening to end their lives. He hands Nina his coat whilst hiding his obvious excitement, quite literally, and tries to escape with them, but it is to no avail. Every direction has been blocked by heretics and knights fighting with one another, and the one escape route he does manage to find is being blocked by a pseudo-apostle. The transformed great goat slaughters heretics and holy men alike and grabs Casca, intending to finish his mating ritual with her. Isidro picks up a boulder to make the great goat let go of the only thing that can help him fulfill his true ambition. 
But he doesn't need to throw it because that's when Guts arrives on the scene. The Black Swordsman starts cleaning house with his Dragon Slayer and tells Isidro they're making a run for it. He entrusts Casca's life to the Stone Thief, trusting in him despite not knowing him for a long time, as he engages the Great Goat, who has decided if he can't have Casca, then no one will. Isidro is clearly touched by this display of blind trust in his skills, and he resolves to make Guts proud whilst accomplishing his goal of becoming his apprentice at the same time. Isidro leads Casca and Nina out of the secret path he had discovered, putting Puck's mind at ease about the success rate of their mission by reminding him he was something of a monkey himself. Their path ends near a rope whose entire length is long enough to deposit a person safely near the mouth of the heretic's cave. No doubt their priest and the human great goat meant to escape using this very rope, but now that Isidro was here, he was going to see it used in service of his own ambition. He lowers Nina down to safety, and is almost done doing the same for Casca when the latter wiggles out of the rope and uses her latent warrior instinct to hop down safely by herself. This knocks Isidro off his rump long enough for him to miss Nina being happened upon by Joachim, who then summons the entire Holy Iron Chain Knights to lead the two girls away. When Guts returns, Isidro sheepishly begs his apology, and for a moment, it appears as though the Black Swordsman might throttle him, but then he thinks better of it. Guts was the one who had told Isidro to do as he wished, and the boy had helped him out of his own free will. Because of Isidro, he knew where Casca was in the first place, and where she was heading now. That thought must have stayed his hand, where previously he'd have murked him without giving it a second thought. But that didn't mean that it didn't bother Isidro. His failure to deliver Casca safely not only meant he'd lost his leverage over Guts, he'd also let him down, which was far worse because he considered the man his idol, though he would never be caught dead saying it out loud. So, Isidro resolved to do the next best thing to regain Guts' complete confidence, be instrumental in saving Casca once again. When he entered the Tower of Conviction, Isidro showed great intelligence and resolve for someone of his age. After finding Nina with Luca and Jerome, he let the other heretics out of their cells, arguing that they would serve as great distractions for any pursuers. Logic that even Jerome couldn't fault. When the murder blobs surrounded their party, Isidro was ready with his stones to try and defend them from harm. He leapt to save a falling Luca without giving it a second thought, and when Mozgus flew away with Casca, Isidro and Puck did the unthinkable. The goofy duo, armed with a brick and a burdock respectively, leap onto Mozgus's back just as he's flying away, and Isidro smashes the pseudo-apostle on his head with his weapon, but sadly, it's to no avail. Father Mozgus simply picks him up by the scruff of his neck and throws him toward the outer wall of the Tower of Conviction before proceeding to give Casca over for burning at the stake. Isidro recovers and curses the fanatics, calling them no better than the heretics they themselves hated so much whilst trying to come up with a plan. The good thing is, he does manage to come up with a plan that ultimately works out. The bad thing is, he literally goes medieval bungee jumping into a literal lit pyre to do it. With Nina, Jerome, and Puck's assistance, Isidro shot puts himself to Casca, who was miraculously placed right below his vantage point, and rescues her from a grisly fate. He pisses off Father Mozgus in the process, but hey, you win some, you lose some. He then saves Casca from one of Mozgus's flying twin disciples, further cementing his redemption, and then yet another unexpected thing happens. Puck becomes useful. Isidro is hurling rocks at the flying twins, trying to keep them from chopping his buddies into pieces, but he can't score a hit because of their speed. He wants them to be still for just a moment so he can hit them directly, and that's when Puck steps up to the plate. The elf uses his Puck Spark ability to emit a blinding flash of light, which stuns the twins long enough for Isidro to hit them directly in their eyes and cause them to come crashing down. Jerome finishes the job, but he is rightfully impressed by the young man's skill with projectiles. After Guts finishes off Father Mozgus, the group spends the rest of the night fending off the malign spirits of the dead with burning torches. Isidro ends up dual-wielding two smaller torches just to put a fine print on his performance. When the sun rises, Saint Albion is blessed with the incarnation of Femto as Griffith, and Isidro is one of many who feel an instinctive sense of reverence at the sight of him. But that quickly fades away, as Griffith takes off with Zod and Saint Albion is run over by Kushan forces. Isidro and the rest manage to escape unnoticed, but Guts and Casca draw attention, and so they split and take a different route. The ever-determined Dropy decides that he is going to track down the Black Swordsman and exact his repayment at any cost, 
and begins chasing guts once again. Along his journey, he comes across Farnese and Serpico, who have secularized themselves and are also looking for guts. Isidro offers to carry their luggage, but being the scoundrel he is, tries to make off with it the next day. He is in the process of escaping them when Puck finds him in the former Holy Iron Chain Knights and brings them to guts. Isidro tries to immediately exact his payment from the Black Swordsman, and demands that Guts make him his disciple and teach him the secrets of his secrets to swordsmanship, but he is ignored by him, and Puck takes advantage of this to make Isidro an adherent of the Elf Dimension style. When Guts asks Farnese and Serpico their reasons for following him, Isidro constantly antagonizes the nobles until the point where, if he pushed it any further, he'd have become the villain. After Guts accepts all of them into his traveling party, the group spends their first night fighting off the dead spirits that flock towards two brands of sacrifice, and Isidro holds his own very well against some bog monsters. But it is after this that his real trial begins when he starts training under the Black Swordsman of Legend. The only protege of the Black Swordsman has a kind heart and an unsaid crush on a witch, Isidro's role in Berserk following his addition to Guts's party. Guts does follow through on his repayment of Isidro's favor by agreeing to train him, but he never agreed to be an excellent hands-on teacher. Their training sessions usually consisted of sparring and basics, because the Black Swordsman argued that Isidro needed to find his own fighting style if he wanted to overcome his size disadvantage. Though he was still 14 years old with ample room for physical growth, life on the battlefield could end within a split second if he didn't know how to use a sword to his advantage. So Guts's main training method was to give Isidro all the tools he needed to become an effective swordsman, and then let him figure out the rest. For example, in their first sparring session, his words were more of a lesson than his whacking, and trust us, there was a lot of that going on. Guts told Isidro that he should use his brain whilst fighting as well, not just his body. Battle IQ was crucial to victory and survival. Using overhead strikes against a larger opponent was an objectively dumb move, and so Isidro needed to find a new angle. The kid didn't just take this criticism to heart and stop working on his skills like most children these days would, Isidro improved in his very next sparring session. After gathering supplies from an elderly gentleman, Isidro and Puck discuss using stones as a possible method to disable Guts' size advantage, but the kid finds that idea unappealing in light of his ambition to become the ultimate swordsman. If he was going to beat Guts, he would have to do it straight, and that's when he struck upon an idea. In their next training session, Isidro used his size to his advantage and dual-wielded wooden sticks to attack Guts' lower body, but was driven back once again by the far superior swordsman. Guts commended his thinking and his improvisation, but advised him that he needed to become more versatile and quick if he wanted to actually survive warfare. When Isidro protested that he needed time to master the basics first, Guts sarcastically commended him for being patient as well, which made the kid realize he had to adapt on the fly. It was at this point that Isidro would get an opportunity to showcase his true skills, and we would get a flashback of his origins as well. A little over a year ago, Isidro had run out on his home village because he was dissatisfied with his life there. He had big aspirations, but the people around him always held him down, so he decided he was going to bet on himself. A conversation he has with an old man called Morgan from Enoch Village reveals that he might resent his family for something they did to him in the past, and that he views the village life itself as a graveyard for the ambitions of the youth. He stops the conversation midway because the old man's touching story about his late family and his encounter with Flora the Witch was about to sway him away from his goals, but it is clear that Isidro looks up to Guts, and ironically enough, he wants to be like him, though he doesn't know it just yet. Isidro's main inspiration to become an unparalleled swordsman was the legendary Hundred Man Slayer of the old Band of the Falcon. Though he knew that man was the raider captain of the band, he wouldn't find out that it was Guts until he reached Elfhelm, and even then, it wasn't exactly clear to him. Him. But with Old Man Morgan's cutlass, Isidro did demonstrate his vastly improved fighting abilities. He was able to use Flora's salamander dagger, the consecrated berries, and the cutlass in conjunction to kill numerous trolls in Klipov, including a giant one who appeared to be their king. Though he was unable to do anything to help defend the village in his own eyes, Isidro has this habit of outperforming expectations, which is why his party has come to rely on him so much. But there are a couple of major plot points with his character that remain unsolved, and as Berserk enters its final stages, it will be curious to see how things play out. The first is his relationship with Shirke. When Shirke debuted in the manga, Isidro immediately groped her to make sure she was a witch. 
She'd turned him into a monkey, and they've had a contemptuous relationship ever since. Neither misses an opportunity to antagonize the other, and both are quick to chastise each other for the slightest of mistakes. And yet it's clear that there is something brewing between the two of them, because of a statement Sonia makes when she meets both of them in Vertanis. She deduces that Shirke has a crush on a swordsman, but she thinks that it's Isidro because it is he who comes to rescue her. When Yzma the Marrow is introduced to the story after the Black Swordsman Party's departure from Britannis for Skellig Island, there are moments when you could say Shirke is jealous of Yzma's close relationship with Isidro. It's clear that Miura set up this teenage love triangle to play out at some point in the story, but with him gone, it's unclear if we'll ever get a conclusion to it. What is more likely is that we will get a resolution to Isidro's ultimate dream, and it will most likely be in a great moment of reckoning. Throughout his journey, Isidro has had to fight wheelbarrow demons, possessed cultists, blobs of man-eating blood, pseudo-apostles, and a literal sea god, but he had never actually killed someone. And no, monsters don't count for obvious reasons. The first became apparent in Vertanis when Isidro took on Bonebeard's crew. It was apparent from his fighting style that he was far more skilled than a regular knight, as he was able to keep up with and outmaneuver both Mule Wolfflame and Bonebeard himself. But Isidro never fought to kill. He was holding back against both of them, and he froze with fear when he accidentally killed a man by cutting his arteries on instinct. Killing is something Isidro hasn't outright done yet, though he has rearranged Mule's face for him and made Bonebeard taste seawater, not in that exact order. As of this moment, he is aboard Roderick's seahorse as one of the few survivors of the destruction of Elfhelm, but his fate remains unknown as the ship heads towards a massive sinkhole in the open ocean. But if we've learned anything from the history of Berserk and Kuji Mori's work on it, one thing is clear. Isidro will kill at some point, and it will be interesting to see how that changes him, because so far, he's the only member of the Black Swordsman party who hasn't had a massive character development moment. Farnese has discovered her potential as a witch, Serpico has embraced his role as a perpetual enforcer and secret half-brother. Casca lost her mind, got it back, and then lost it again, and Shirke found her fate in the Black Swordsman. Berserk is Guts' story, so we don't need to tell you anything about that, and heck, even Puck's involvement turned out to be preordained according to Danon, which leaves Isidro's role in all of this a bit unclear. What we think is going to happen is that he's going to be forced to kill someone to protect either Shirke or Isma. The most logical choice would be Mule, because he's the only one Isidro has a score to settle with, but we think it could also be Sonia. And if that's true, then it adds a whole nother layer of tragedy to the story. Shirke and Sonia are friends, and yet the latter is a medium of the Falcon of Darkness. When duty tests friendship, and the Owl doesn't even get a say in it, what happens then? If Isidro ends up killing someone Shirke values in order to protect her, it will take their story arc into a whole different direction. And that is why this kid is such an important character in Berserk. Isidro gets a lot of hate for being a goofy kid, but that's because that's exactly what he is. He's a good-natured young man with big dreams and a tiny best friend who has been making it in the real world without fully committing to its grimy reality. It's the moment he does that that we're waiting for, and when it comes, if it does, you know it's going to be Berserk. Marvelous Verdict And that's our video. Isidro is actually one of our favorite manga sidekicks of all time, simply because of how goofy he manages to stay in the midst of utter madness. Sure, Miura might have turned him and Chestnut Puck into a comedic duo on purpose, but it works because their brevity is much needed in the dark story that is Berserk. But more than that, Isidro has a story that many of us in this modern day and age can actually relate to. He ran away from home to make it big in the world, and has preserved through hell and back quite literally without breaking. If you think about it, he's downright inspirational, even if he is a tiny little pervert who enjoys harassing witches and elves. But that is what makes his eventual test of manhood so dreadful. Knowing Isidro, we are 99% sure he'll manage to retain his humanity and redeem himself immediately after, as he always does. But that 1% chance of him losing himself is what scares us the most. And perhaps that is the beauty of the masterpiece that is Berserk. Let us know how you feel about Dropy and his elfin Yoda down in the comments section. And we'll see you next time. And, as always, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This has been Cory Whelan for Marvelous Videos. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.